to this webinar series. We co-organize this webinar series in collaboration with uh, Trend in Africa and also Worldwide Neuro Initiative. Uh, you can find more about this organization in the description uh, uh, box down below if you want. You can find their links down below. Uh, today we are very uh, fortunate to have a very special speaker, Professor James Olobade, uh, who uh, is going to talk about uh, a very important topic to us today. We will be talking about uh, neuroscience investigations in the virgin lands of African biodiversity. So let me quickly introduce him. Uh, professor James Olobadi is a professor of comparative anatomy and neuroscience at the University of, at the University of Ibadan. He received his uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Ibadan and then an MSc and PhD from the same university. He did a postdoc at the Department of Experimental Neurosurgery in Penn State College of Medicine in the U.S. as an Ibro Fellow and another postdoc at the University Clinic Fulsburg in Germany as a Alexander von Humboldt Fellow. He was also a grad Fellow in Marine Biology Laboratory in Woods Hall, Woods Hall in the U.S. His research interests are in craniofacial comparative anatomy and environmental neurotoxicology and neuroprotection. He has over uh, 100 publications and has been a supervisor for more than 25 postgraduate examination in comparative anatomy and neuroscience. His research has been funded by IBRU, ISN, and many others. Uh, Professor Olopade is a member of uh, IBRU African Regional Council and a counselor of the International Society of Neurochemistry. So before we get started, I just would like to remind you to type your questions in the comment section of this YouTube live streaming and Professor James will reply at the end. Professor James, again, thank you so much for accepting our, our invitation and, uh, and now I'm now going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mossab. I welcome all to this webinar. I'm grateful to Sona and Trend and all the partners, organizing partners. So straight, we'll be talking about neuroscience investigations in the virgin lands of African biodiversity. Um, as an introduction, my research focus is in craniofacial and comparative anatomy and also in neuroscience. Um, under neuroscience, I work on two in two fronts environmental neurotoxicology and as an anatomist i also do basic and applied neuroanatomy uh, i'm grateful to neuroscience society of nigeria who have invited me as a plenary speaker in the nsn conference that i'll be holding towards the end of the year and there i'll be talking more about environmental neurotoxicology so today i will just stick to basic and applied neuroanatomy aspect of my work. And going into that, I first want to honor two leading lights who have contributed virtually their entire career into studying of neuroscience of biodiversity in Africa, Professor Noria Lagdagazal in Mohammed V University in Rabat, and Professor Paul Manga at the University of Wits in South Africa. As you well know, Africa is a continent rich in biodiversity, both flora and fauna, animals and plants, and Africa has one of the largest biodiverse population of rodents, and one of the largest with birds. Uh, I guess it's no secret that it's been a resource limited environment as far research and the consequence of that is most of research funding goes more into infectious diseases and most of the leading lights want to go to where the funding is but in the last two decades it's now been a focus on the indigenous animals in the continent and looking at their neuroscience profile to see whether there are unique architectures, unique cellular expressions, 
within these animals. And today I'll be speaking about on four animals, the African giant rat, the greater cane rat, the striped owl, and the Edolon bats. So I'll just be giving a brief uh, recap of the work that has been going on in our laboratory with this. So I'll start with the African giant rat and the African giant rats work started in my lab with a master student uh, close to seven or eight years ago, if not a decade. Uh, Matteo Lude started his masters with working on the skull of the African giant rat in our cranial facial anatomy unit, and then the PhD progressed into the neuroscience. And what we looked at was the growth of the brain, uh, neonates, juvenile, and the adult. And you can see from the screen, you have the neonate brain. And it's, as it progresses into the adult, you have an increase in the olfactory bulb. And you also have evidence of myelination as the brain gets whiter and creamier. And then by the time it gets to the adult, you have seen a far more increase in the olfactory bulb. So this work has spanned a few years. One of the recently published papers from this work was looking at myelination in the African giant rats from the neonate level where you have a lot of pre-myelinating oligodendrocytes. And at birth, you have the presence of CMPAs positive oligodendrocytes and then as still at the neonate evidence of myelination starting and then by the time we get to the adult at the olfactory bulb we could see streams of myelinated axons and we, we studied the electron microscopy of this looking at the oligodendrocytes and the myelinating and myelinated axons this was re recently published in Anatomia Histologia. And one of the early works we published on this was the olfactory bulb. Interestingly, the African giant rat has been a translational animal being used to sniff out landmines, sniff tuberculosis. And I think now that we are in the COVID era, some of us must have been hearing and seeing um, clips of animals being trained to be able to detect the smell of COVID patients, samples from COVID patients. So for a while, over a decade, the African giant rat was being used to sniff landmines and without really a knowledge of the basic uh, neuroscience behind um, that translational work. So Matthew went on to study the histology, the cytoarchitecture of the olfactory bulb published in Anatomical Science International. And we, elucidated the, all the full layering of the olfactory bulb from the olfactory nerve layer, the glomerulus layer, the external plexiform, the molecular cell layer, the gl glomerular cell layer, and the paraventricular layers. And what was interesting particularly here was the rich um, paraglo paraglomerular cells, tough cells, axons that surrounds the glomerulus. We, we have looked at um, animals like the greater cane rat, and uh, there was a work published of recent from eBay in which you can't see this density of tough cells and paraglomerular cells around the uh, glomerulus. And recently we were involved in a work where we were looking at effect of cannabis, chronic cannabis exposure in rats and one striking thing we noted was the depletion of these paraglomerular cells in rats in the control compared to uh, cannabis. And such work has taken an important uh, translational in, um, paradigm because I mean, looking at some of the respiratory diseases from MERS to SARS, even to COVID, you, you have these symptoms of anosmia, absence of smell. The good thing I have about the olfactory system is the, the fact that the plasticity within the olfactory system and the regeneration 
of the olfactory nerves. And I think that's why things like the announcement from Mars and COVID have been seen to be transient. So we also looked at the infrastructure of the glial cells in the African giant rats and looking at the glomerular layer, we see fibrous astrocytes, long dendrites of the astrocytes within the glomerular layer and relatively shorter dendritic um, outflow in the paraventricular layer of the, of the olfactory bulb. And we also noticed that around the glomerular layer, many of the axons there were positive for CMPAs. And so myelinated, so the axons around the glomerular, many of them were myelinated and where we identify streams of myelinated fibers, particularly in the rostra migratory stream of the olfactory bulb. We also look at the presence of node regeneration in the olfactory bulb, looking at double cotton and KI-67 labeling, and you could see bipolar, many bipolar axons, neurons, that were positive for DCX, and particularly in the glomerular layer, many axons were positive for DCX. And we also, in the, virtually all the strata of the glomerular layer, we could see KI-67 positive cells. So both in the neonate, the juvenile, and also in the adult stage, even though decreasing with age. The one major work that Matthew did as part of his PhD was looking at the heterogeneity of astrocytes within the African giant rat. This was published in Frontiers in Neuroanatomy. And with, a, with Golgi stain, we were able to locate astrocytes, making synapses with pyramidal neurons. We saw that at the early stage, the intensity of staining was a bit low. The dendrites were small. And but as the animals picked up with age, the soma increased greatly at the juvenile, but also reduced at the adult. Although we actually noticed in the sub um, subventricular layers of the mesencephalon, even in the neonates, we had a, a high dendritic aborization that was present. So looking at the astrocyte heterogeneity, um, we noticed that in the cortex of the African giant rat, you mainly saw protoplasmic astrocytes, more of fibrous astrocytes in the corpus callosum, and uh, olfactory bulb had actually a mixture of fibrous and protoplasmic astrocytes, and you see um, radial, radial isoforms of the astrocytes in the paraventricular area. Still looking at the astrocyte heterogeneity, we, we noticed unique perivascular astrocytes in the cortex. Um, the, the hippocampus also had a mixture of uh, protoplasmic, valid, and fibrous astrocytes. You had mainly fibrous astrocytes in the brainstem, and unique streams of Bergman gleg was seen in the cerebellum. Um, when it comes to heterogeneity of the presence of multiple isoforms of astrocytes, that was majorly seen in the olfactory bulb that had different forms of about four different isoforms of the astrocytes were seen in the olfactory bulb. I think the um, one other major paper we published early was looking at adult neurogenesis in the African giant rat brain. Um, this slide showing um, KI-67. Um, staining immunolocalization in the neonate brain and this we saw in the dentate gyrus and in the ventricular zones subventricular zone and by the time we went to the juvenile it was also present but the as expected the density of stain was slightly reduced but at the adult stage both at the dentate gyrus and at the paraventricular zone you had a reduction in the positive KI-67 um, cells, albeit they were present in all age categories. 
Looking at DCX, uh, we also saw DCX in the paraventricular units. You can see a, a high spread of the DCX in the juvenile, but markedly reduced in the in the adults. In the adults, we looked at KI positive cells in the non what I can call the non usual locations. Haven't looked at it in where we expected the subventricular zone and the dentate gyrus, but we're able to see um, KI seven positive cells in the cell in the near the Purkinje of the cerebellum in the in the cortex in the cortex of the African giant rat and DCS positive cells new neurons being formed in the second layer of the somatosensory cortex the piriform cortex and also in the anterior commissure of the epithalamus so these were areas go haven't done serial sections these were areas that we saw positive KI 67 and DC extending away from the um, well known characterized subventricular zones and the dented gyros. Well, while this work was going on, um, we were joined by a young student who came in, young as a junior faculty, doing his postgraduate studies. And he joined the team and he looked at the hippocampus closely. He published this work recently, Cytoarchitecture of hippocampal formation of the African giant rat. And the hippocampus is, is typical to what you normally see in rat, even though you can see uh, a slight variation, particularly in the presentation of the dentate gyros and the, and, the, and the helos morphology. And looking at the helos of the hippocampus uh, closely at high magnification, what was striking to us was the presence of uh, polymorphic Polymorphic cells, pyramidal cells, mitral cells, granular cells, all present in the high loss of the dented gyros of the African, in the hippocampus of the African giant rat. And then we did a, a, a counting of the cells of the CA1, CA2, CA3, and surprisingly to us, at the high cellular density in the CA3. Of the, of, the, of the hippocampus in the African giant rats. And uh, Musti did a face microscopy and did a heat map based on cellular density. And here you could see the present, the pyramidal cells of the, of the dented gyros um, showing clearly in the granular cell layer. Okay, so I think this is the, Last work I'll be showing from the African giant rats. This is, I think this work has just been sent for publication. Many years ago, when we looked at the, the ependema layer in the ventricle, we saw multiple layering. And that was worries, worrisome to us because by our basic training, ependema layers are single layers or maybe with some transitory. Um, presentations, but these were clear multi layer appearance. Uh, in, in some of the studies I've done in environmental neurotoxicology, we knew that when you have meta neurotoxicity, part of the manifestation of the toxicity is multiple layering, particularly in the Purkinje. So we, we, were, we were skeptical about this, um, about this slide. We just kept it and never said anything. I think it was first meeting in Milan that I had a, I, I saw a poster of a researcher from New Zealand that was showing multiple layering in the ependema cells of some goat breeds in New Zealand. And th that, uh, that picked up a very interesting discussion that we had seen this in the uh, African giant rat. And he, he said that it, it, was, a, it was a surprise um, finding to him also quite controversial. So that made us study the ependema layer in in details, so we looked at the scanning electron microscopy, the villi of the of the ependema layer, and the the rich ciliated um, array that we have. At least was a conviction that we were not dealing with um, pathological specimen, which was our fear when we saw the multiple layering of the ependema cells. And so, in the transmission microscope, you could see 
the scanning, you could see the cilia and then transmission microscope, so rich normal cilia formation. And this paper is being submitted, it's being submitted to Annals of Anatomy. Um, this is a, a striking picture of a transverse section of a cilia showing the normal microtubule array that we were taught in grad school of, of nine tubes surrounding two central tubes. Okay, so our work, apart from the African giant rat, also moved us to the greater cane rats. These are two different rats. The African giant rat is pregnant for slightly less than 30 days. So it was a good model for us to study. The problem, however, with the African giant rat is when it is captured from the wild and is being raised in captivity, the oestrus cycle gets suspended. They do not get pregnant. And that's, that became a big problem for us for years trying to do a comprehensive study. However, the greater king rat will breed in captivity. But the disadvantage with the greater king rat is that the greater king rat is pregnant for five months, 150 days. So you have two rats, one was pregnant for 30 days, and, but, but will not breed in captivity. But the other one is pregnant for 150 days and will breed in captivity. So we got Musti to move to his PhD studying the brain development of the greater cane rat. And we were eager to see what was happening in the brain for about 150 days of development, a long first trimester. But to our surprise, the greater cane rat goes through suspended development, arrested development. So the first 50 days, we couldn't see a forming zygote. It's like after fertilization, you have an arrest. The first time we saw a clear gross brain was at day 60. And we had actually published this, the work that we had done on the scanning of, so we actually had the live animals and were able to do the ultrasound of the pregnant animals at different days of gestation. So we saw nothing, first 50 days, and 60 days you had the brain pop out with telencephalic vesicles and a rhombencephalon, and then by day 70, the midbrain starts to show, and by the time we got to day 90, we could see clear rostral and caudal colliculi, which kept developing until day 100, and by day 110, the cerebellum started to pick up in, in development. We had increased the cerebellum by the 120, and uh, by the 130, the gyrification of the telencephalon became obvious, and by 140 days, we we're already having a full brain development. So we did a 10-day a day span of uh, pregnancy, of gestation in the greater cane rat. And when we did the brain weight, the absolute brain weight, what we saw was that you had a high, a peak, in brain weight at about day 90, somewhere between day 80 and 90, and another peak between day 120 and 130. And by the time we did investigated all our studies, these two peaks correlated with the peak period of neurogenesis and also the peak period of gliogenesis in the greater Ken rats. So uh, Musti, as part of his PhD, looked into um, gliogenesis, neurogenesis and um, the corticogenesis, the upper and deeper layer characterization. So using these different markers, PAC6 for stem cells, TBR2 for uh, that stem cells that were picking the neuronal lineage, neuronal progenitor cells. We looked at the upper, deep and upper layer of um, neurons that were, pro that were migrating, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, myelin formation and neuronal markers looking at the, the soma, the dendrites, and the 
axons. So, like I've said, at day 50, we couldn't really pick the, we couldn't pick a gross brain. So what we did was to take the whole head, because the brain was so small, and then did a serial section of the whole head so that we could study the brain. And what we saw was clear brain positive pack six cells. These are all stem cells. And you could see the, the telencephalic ventricle and then the diencephalon already the encephalic vesicle being formed. So you have the prosencephalon and then the telencephalon and the diencephalon differentiating, uh, or let me say, debarkating early um, as stem cells. And when we looked at TBR2, which is um, differentiating neurons from stem cells, it was negative. So at day 50, you do not have a differentiation into neuronal milligets. You have almost a 100% population of neural stem cells and as we approach the 60 then you started having more presence of um tbr2 by the um tbr2 started showing by day 80 you had a full presence of differentiated um, um differentiating neurons and that's why we could see that peak period of uh, 80 days that peak period of 80 days of brain weight which, co which corresponds with the peak period of neurogenesis. And then by day 130, you already have our neurons uh, fully formed with minimal stem cells. And this, in looking at neuronal differentiation, you could see at day 60, you had cells that were positive for DAPI, they were, they were in positive for soma, dendrite, and axon. So these were still stem cells, the neural stem cells. And by day 70, we started having, now that you have neuronal differentiation um, increasing, you have presence of the soma within the, there's the, the, in the layering of the cortex, moving into the middle layers. And then you have um, the highest width by the 80, which was peak period of neurogenesis. And then stem cells have started reducing. And by the time we are at day 130, you have the streak of, um, to soma, but you have the axons in the cortical areas fully formed, axons and dendrites fully formed with a, with a virtually fully formed cortex by day 130. Okay, so by day 80, we started seeing neurogenesis. However, by day 60, day 80, there was no active presence of glia being formed. We could see rudimentary staining of glia cells by day 100 in the greater cane rat in utero, and prenatally by the 130, 110 into 120, you had a clear presence of um, glial cell differentiation, that's astrocytes. And so peak astrocyte proliferation was between the 120 and the 130. When it, when it had to do with the oligodendrocytes, we also, we also didn't see much formation between the 60, but by the 80, we are seeing, um, we are seeing um, global scattered uh, presence of oligodendrocyte, but this was evidence of full formation was shown by the 100 and by the 140, we had um, 130 to 140, we had oligodendrocyte oligo two staining virtually throughout the uh, cortical layers. Well, even though you have my, uh, myelin showing up at the 80, you want to, we want to look at when are these oligodendrocytes, when do they start myelinating? When are we moving from pre-myelinating to myelinating? So the this, this 60, the 70, the 80, we saw no myelin staining in our animals, but because these animals are born and um, their eyes are open, they, are, they, they, they can walk around to an extent. And so by day 100, we only saw isolated scarce immunolocalization of myelin basic protein, which was just slightly started to increase by the 110, but by the 120, you, we already have um, full myelin formation. And by the 140, we we'll see the corpus callosum here rich in myelin stain, staining. So, um, so our major finding was that we could see 
you can actually harvest pure neural stem cells by the 150 peak neurogenesis is from about the 80 um, neuronal differentiation about the same time axonal differentiation um, about the 180 myelination is about the 120. Remember, I said that the gestation period is about 150 days. So uh, we have a master student join us in the lab uh, just over a year ago, and we decided to move into the adult greater cane rat with the success we've been having with the prenatal stage. We decided to study the epithalamic glands of the greater cane rat, the pineal gland, the epiphysis, and the pituitary gland, the hypophysis. So, and this was Gilbert's work, um, rounding up his masters. So, from the dorsal level of the brain stem, we could see the pineal gland, um, as expected, just clearly in front of the um, rostral colliculi. And we could see strikingly here, the caudal colliculi is relatively bigger than the rostral colliculi. The greater canrats are um, nocturnal animals and have their survival instinct more from hearing than from vision. So this is the pineal gland and in rostral to it is this stri a pair of strimedullary thalamine. So Gilbert removed the um, pineal gland, the pituitary gland from the cellar torsica and you have the ishmus and the neurohypophysis and you have the adenohypophysis with a slightly clear, clear, even gross demarcation between the neurohypophysis and the adenohypophysis. So looking at the histology of the pineal gland, um, you see just above the third ventricle, and we see the presence of pineal follicles, pineal follicles, follicular cells, and looking into the substance of the pineal gland, we saw two types of pinellocytes, and based on classification and literature, the eosinophilic and the basophilic, those are the pinellocyte type one and pinellocyte type two. Um, at the pituitary, like we have the, the adeno and the neurohypophysis with the hypothalamic cleft, and then we saw the, inter we, we saw the intermediate layer, and this is the histology showing the clear, sharp demarcation between the intermediate layer and the neurohypophysis. Taking a deeper look, higher magnification, we, we, we saw the uh, pitis, the pitisites, the pitisites in the um, neurohypophysis, the neurons, and then the herring bodies were present in the neurohypophysis, and the adenohypophysis had the acidophilic the chromophobes and the chromophile cells. Okay, so doing an immunostaining of our epithalamic gland, we look at the pineal gland, and then uh, we saw both a combination of fibrous and protoplasmic astrocytes and the presence of some um, glial cells, the astrocytes, the around the blood vessel peri perivascular glia were also seen in the pineal gland. Looking at the pituitary, not surprisingly, the adenohypophysis had no colocalization for glial cells. The intermediate layer had no colocalization, but we could see staining at the neurohypophysis. And looking at it at the higher magnification, what was striking was that most of the glial cells were resting, resting glial cells, resting astrocytes, what was, was uh, present in the neurohypophysis. And we look, also looked at IBA1 in the pineal gland, uh, the, the most, the IBA stain, the IBA stain showed astro, um, microglia with dendrites. Some microglia were also, were also paravas, paravascular and the presence of capsular, meningeal microglia are found in the capsule region of the of the pineal gland. The as the microglia we saw all had dendrites. We didn't see amoebic isoforms of the pineal gland. I'm, I'm the isoforms of the microglia in the pineal gland. I beg your pardon. 
We also stand for collagen one, and in the pineal gland, as expected, the collagen one was was picked at the capsule capsular area. Um, we were hoping to see if um, if we had localization within the body of the pineal gland, if there were positive collagen cells, but they were all negative. But at the pituitary, apart from the capsule in the neural hypothesis, we had positive collagen, uh, collagen one stain in the substance of the neural hypothesis correlating to areas where we have um, nerve sheets. Okay, uh, that was Gilbert's work with the greater king rat. The la uh, maybe one thing to chip in at the greater king rat histology we did was uh, Musti, who, who was who is rounding up his PhD, was the was the first to find out. I mean, by trial and error, that antibodies raised in rats hardly work for the greater king rat. It was antibodies raised in mouse, so that was very important and made our work easier when Gilbert was doing his master. So we just made sure we went straight for uh, mouse developed um, antibodies for to stain. So. This was another master student. Tony uh, was a student of mine when I was visiting professor at the University of Meduguri, and he was handed over to me for his master's project. And I asked him, in the local area you come from, is there any unique animal in your environment? And he said, oh, that in Gombe area of North Central Nigeria, not East Nigeria, where he comes from, that you have striped owl. So I told him, okay, go to your village and go get us some owl, which he did. We perfused them. We brought out the brains and uniquely, we saw large telencephalic vesicles, a very big rostral colliculus, which actually came out um, in the midbrain area, visible outside and actually reduced the growth of the cerebellar hemispheres. But you had the striking vermis reduced cerebellar hemisphere and a huge uh, rostral colliculi. This, this actually is um, typical with what you see in many birds in the gross morphology of the brain. So we did histology of the hippocampus, well, which was typical, but you can obviously as an anatom anatomy see a slight variation in its morphology presentation. The CA1, the CA2, and relatively small dentate gyrus which is shown here at high magnification. And what was striking to us at the histology was the persistent external granular layer that we saw in the cerebellum. So the typical outer molecular, the Purkinje, uh, unicellular Purkinje, the cellular layering, and then the inner granular. But you had striking external um, granular layer, and it was present in all the animals. I, I guess with time, if we have the opportunity and the privilege to do an age-related, because we really didn't know how to age the owl, they were caught from the wild, and they did they didn't all they didn't look juvenile to us. I mean, we have worked with mice by day 14, postnatal, the external granular layer disappears. So so it may be that the owl is an animal with persistent external granular layer, and, and from some of the work we have also done in our lab. The external granular layer normally stains for, it's positive for nesting, and um, these are stem cells. So whether you have persistent stem cells layering in the owl is something open to investigation. But strikingly, looking at carbindine stain in the cerebellum, carbindine, grateful to Dr. Lamidewu, produced carbindine in a lab, a calcium binding stain that actually stains for Purkinje and is dendritic arborization. We saw a unique, huge um, dendritic arborization of the, of the cerebellar cortex of the owl. This was present in the vermis. And one interpretation we think for this is that because of the reduced um, growth of the cerebellar hemisphere, that the vermis, the arborization of the vermis may be a, a huge arborization, may be a compensation. To, to do a full function of the cerebellum for the 
all we've just recently submitted this work to international journal of veterinary science and medicine we also tried to do the localization of glial cells in the owl here we looked at ibawan stain and just like what we saw in the greater in the greater cane rat you could see um the microglia with dendrites we couldn't see any um amoebic isoforms the glial cells this is cerebral cortex the astrocytes we saw few protoplasmic but far more fibrous astrocytes most in the in the african giant rats in the cortex we mainly saw protoplasmic astrocyte but here we see a lot of fibrous astrocytes and we also got a good co-localization of myelin basic protein in the cerebellum last slides i will show rounding up is in the uh, edolon and epomo bats which we're also doing a basic anatomy of these fruit bats um dr lopade uh, worked with us in 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 this study which is still ongoing so the um few data we have here is from the cerebellum we looked at the cerebellum of the bat um using gorgi stain showing the um cell body and the dendrite formation the crystal violet from the midline of the vermis where we took the sections from we saw relatively uh unique ice um isometric dimensions, virtually similar sizes of the porkinje. This was at the mid-sagittal mid view of the vermis. And when we did the carbindine stain, definitely the uh, from what you can see, the carbindine, the arborization of the, the dendrites of the porkinje was far lower, far, far lower compared to what we saw in the hour. But we also see this isometric uh, presentation of the Purkinje cells of the bats. And looking at glia, glia heterogeneity, uh, we have seen in the outer molecular Bergman glia, uh, we saw fibrous astrocytes in the cortex of the, of the, uh, of the bats, and then um, velet, velet astrocytes in the, just at the junction of the Purkinje, and the downward cell layer. And using the S100 state, we, we were also able to confirm the presence of um, astrocytes. So in the bat, both standing for S100 and GFAP, the valid astrocytes at the same location. I think at um, the rounding up, we also did the electron microscopy of the molecular layer, the Purkinje layer, and the granular layer inner granular layer of the cerebellum striking is the huge density so that um, we lost connection we, we i i'll just go to the last slide on slides on the bat okay so i would finished the greater cane rat and then the owl and then so we worked on the dolom bat and i i just round up by saying that the bat we did a mid sagittal section and then we saw isoforms um Isomet isometric nature of the Purkinje and the carbindine also showed that, and you had far less carbindine arborization uh, compared to what you are having in the owl. And we looked at the glial cells, we saw the Bergman glia uh, isoform in the cerebellum, fibrous astrocytes in the cortex, and valid astrocytes in the Burkinje layer and in the S100 also found around the Burkinje layer. 
the molecular layer of the cerebellum, the Purkinje layer, the granular layer at electron microscopy. So this is what Dr. Lokwade worked with us. Unique is this heterochromatic expression of the nucleus of the Purkinje. So future directions. Um, feel that Africa has unique biodiversity that we can continue to study. Um, we can do a complete chemical neuroanatomy of the entire brain. For now, many of the studies is from partly a particular coronal section or a sagittal section, but we can do a complete mapping of, of GABA, of serotonin, of, of unique neurotransmitters and have a complete neuronal network, maybe in the African giant rat, in the greater king rat. And then we have the possibility of also purifying and raising stem cells from these animals. The greater king rat, for example, was, um, it takes about 60 days for us to see the gross brain. So when we can get the stem cells, in the first 50 days, there could be some unique protein um, expressions that will be unique to these animals. So that's the, that's the opportunity we have based on these unique biodiversities. I'm grateful to Professor Madi. Uh, I was at SONA conference in Ethiopia, and Professor Madi and Pomanga were presenting their work with Hannah Lips and Lips and Peter Lips on um, neurogenesis of animals in the African continent. And the African giant rat was not there. Matthew then just finished his master's working on skull. And that's why we, we partnered with them and did our work on the brain of the African giant rat. Um, I was at European Association of Veterinary Anatomists. And that's where I met Professor Simon talking about cortical development. And that's how we entered into a collaboration which we could study the greater cane rat and its prenatal development. Grateful to Frederick Lufler Institute, where Dr. Lopade did the work on cerebellum and the Alexander von Humboldt linkage grants uh, that provided money to study the bats and also gave us opportunity to have antibodies for most of this work that we did. Um, thank you very much. And happy to have your questions. Thank you, Osama. Thank you so much for this uh, enlightening and stimulating talks. Let me see if we have some comments or questions from our audience. But before that, as a role model and, and a great mentor to many, do you have any uh, advice for our young audience to, uh, to, to advance their career in, in neuroscience? Uh, I guess the major advice I will have is the one I actually gave towards the, hinted at towards the end is very important for young people, particularly those finishing their PhD or who have just finished and entering into tenured positions to go to good conferences. There you see good science going on. And for us in Africa, then it gives you opportunity for collaboration. So do the best you can within your environment, relate with people in other clients who are doing excellent work, and then you can collaborate. You are bringing something to the table, and they are also bringing something, and then you have a strong collaboration, and then you now build a generation of students on strong collaboration. And then we have a, a firm fit to stand on by the time they are finishing their PhD. They are already exposed. They are already exposed to different techniques. They are already going to good conferences. So I think that's very important that I know sometimes in Africa we do not have resources for conference, but I always say conference attendance is an investment in your own self. So do everything you can to invest in yourself. Okay, so with this question from Rayan, she's, she's basically trying to ask if this African gen uh, rat is suitable model to study neurodegenerative disorders. Yeah, I do not see why the African giant rats cannot be used. Um, it's a long shot when you come to things like transgenics, because it's an animal we are still knowing its full genetic profile. But if I can just let the cat out of the bag a little, since I'll be speaking in, in uh, Port Harcourt at the neuroscience meeting, you actually have 
African giant trust that we've studied from polluted environments showing a, showing Parkinson like um, pathologies. And then we've studied the meta profile of those rats and we could see a derangement in meta profile, oxidative stress, just like what you are seeing in, um, in Parkinson's disease. So they are good models for neurodegenerative diseases. Albeit, we still have a lot of work to do to develop them so that they are standardized. Okay. So we have another, another comment or question. I don't know if you. So he's basically asking, or he's saying, um, aware that routine ratus novergicus is less encephalic. Does it mean giant uh, oh, great uh, uh, cane rat is an exceptional to this? Yeah, there's, there's gerification in the greater camera, but still is minimal. Okay. It's but it's there. So compared to the um compared to the routine laboratory rats and the great African giant rats, the greater K rat has some aspects of gerification. They do. So and and that's very important because. When, when you like someone asked a question about raising up models, when, when, you are, when you want to do a model, for example, for traumatic brain disease, traumatic brain injury, one of the, one of the setbacks to using rats in the lab is that rats are lysencephalic and they know that the gyrification of the brain, like you have in human, also has its role in the pathogenesis of TBI. So when you're having a, another rat now that has gyrification, even though it's relatively mild, but it becomes a better model to study things like traumatic brain injury. Okay, so another question here. Is it possible that the blessed cells of the hippocampus have a unique connection with the pituitary that modulates reproductive hormone secretion and impact on the reproductive cycle in the African giant tract? That's a very good question, open. And you are just that person who asked the question just threw down a research proposal. So that, that's something we don't know. That is something we do not know. Um, in other rats, people have tried to study the hypothalamus pituitary axis, but in the greater cane rats, you don't have studies like that. The only thing I would just say is that they are spontaneous ovulators. Okay, but the link between the hippocampus to the pituitary, I can assure you there is no data on that on the greater king rat. Okay, so a question from Saleh. Uh, thank you, Prof, for the stimulating lecture. However, can we conveniently say that African gene rat and uh, GCR are the choice model for neurodegenerative disease? Okay, you already, I think, uh, replied. I think I've question. answered. Yeah. I've answered this yeah. in the other question. Yeah. It has its own unique roles. It can play. It's it's when when we start and we start producing data, and then you can find out that wow, this gives you a better model than the rats. We in the traumatic brain injury. Um, I, I think there's there's a model that is being used now, apart from rats, because of their gerification. So there are other animals that are being used because they see them to be better models to the rat. So if we start getting data from this uh, with, with a, in a Parkinson-like model, traumatic brain injury model, and we see that it gives us better pathogenesis compared to the normal laboratory rats, people are going to make a switch. Okay. In the blood vessel network, for example, the blood, the circle of village, the blood vessel network, we've, we've not really studied that in the greater, in the greater King rat. So if we see that now to be, to be a better model for those who are studying stroke, so it, it could pick up. So it is the more you study things that you can give information when your work is standardized that it could be a better model than the laboratory rat or mice. So, so a question from the same person, what are the challenges associated with domesticating these models? Okay, that's a nice question. Um, the greater king rat, there's hardly any problem with the greater king rats. The greater king rat is easily domesticated. I know of two large farms in Nigeria. Um, we, we partnered with them. That's where we got our samples from where they, 
there is good power security. They keep very good records. So, and since Geta Kenras are spontaneous ovulators, so when the male is introduced, most times the pregnancy timing is, is accurate. So with the Greater King Rat, you do not have challenges. With the African Giant Rat, they do not breed in captivity. And I mean, in the lab with Dr. Lude and Dr. Mustafa, we've been racking ahead that it's actually possible because the African Giant Rat really is the best because it's pregnant for only 30 days. If we could time that pregnancy, but once we capture them and put them in cages and they do not reproduce, but if we can actually create an artificial um, if you can mimic the local, the habitat in an artificial way, we actually bring the rat, the, it looks as if they are still in the bush, but whereas it's, it's surrounded with barbed wires, the, the, the inner, inner foundation is concretized so that they do not borrow in, and the animal feels they are still in the traditional habitat. We can definitely do such an experiment. I mean, this is an idea we've had in the lab, it's the funny to do so because that will make the uh, the work that we are trying to do building stem cells easy because the great the greater the African giant are just breed for thirty days, so it's something we all have to think about. Okay, uh, another question from Amino. Great works. So on the GCR, do we know at what stage of gestational development? Uh, the at what at what stage of gestational development the rest took place? And what do okay. you suggest is the implication of this? Well, I guess that's what we are still studying. The, it, was the, it was in the course of our study that we noticed this gestational arrest. Uh, it, has, um, it has drawn interest from collaborators in Germany, in Switzerland, and particularly in Switzerland, where they've been looking at some other species that experienced that. But we know that um, what we guess is after fertilization, Within a very a few days, you have a, a gestational arrest, and you do not see virtually no development in the zygote for about 50, 50 days. This is one third of the um, gestational period. So the literature suggests that animals will go through such th that it's it's a survival instinct, so that um, the through the evolution, they, it was that period of arrest that they acclimatize with the environment of the uterus and have higher chances of surviving if they go through such arrest. Like probably in evolution, such animals normally die after birth, but that arrest has led to better development in utero and that they are able to cope with life thereafter. How true that is, those who don't go through the arrest, they also develop life after. So we really can't get the correlation. I mean, as an anatomist, I know that the, 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 the testis of the elephant is inside the abdomen. The testis of the goat is outside. But we are told that once you have a testicular arrest in the abdomen, the testis doesn't develop. And that's the truth. So the abdominal temperature but in the, in the elephant is permanently in the abdomen. So some things are not just easy direct correlates like that. So I think a lot of work has to be done on what really is this implication for this gestational arrest? Okay, so okay. I was asking, uh, what could be the unique cytoarchitectural feature of the, olfactory, of the olfactory bulb of the African gene rats that could make them sniff out landmines and tuberculosis? Yeah, and I, I guess one, one of the things we've talked about is the, is the, is the relatively huge glomerular layer, the high density of periglomerular axons, tufts, tufts axons, my, the axons are myelinated. You have a rich synapse between the olfactory nerve layer and the glomerular layer. So um, the, some of the labradors um, that are being used now to sniff COVID, um, this uh, Spaniard, uh, cockerel dogs, they have about 350,000 um, olfactory neurons. I'm sure um, the giant rats, as per, per density wise, may be higher than that. So I guess those are some of the things we still need to study, but the, the high density of periglomerular 
axons, and the fact that many of them are myelinated and the rich synapse between the olfactory nerve layer and the axons of the glomerular layer is definitely a uh, an adaptation for good sense of factory acumen. So another question, is there a comparison between the neuron, neuronal architecture of the species of rats used with the common albino rats? Um, well, like I said in most of the time, I will say what we see here is typical, but you can see a slight variation. Okay. So, mm -hmm. for example, I mean, in the in the in the owl, we we saw a persistent external granular layer. So that we are still still needs more investigation to know that does this persist into old age? That would be unique. That's present in the rodent, where it disappears mm -hmm. after fourteen days. In human, it is known to live after about three months. So, but it was persistent in the in the owl. Um, the huge arborization abor, abor, mm -hmm. that we saw in the owl, in the vermis, with the Purkinje dendrites, it's quite unique. We, we don't see that in the, in, the, in the rodents. So the unique advantage, phenotypic advantage that it can give is what we now have to be uh, identifying in the morphophysiology, that having this unique morphological expression Sometimes do they have physiological correlates with them? Uh, yeah, so we have a comment from uh, Professor Tom Bading, uh, co founder of Trend in Africa. He said a great answer on how to form collaboration or collaborators. Uh, so he is uh, uh, encouraging all the audience to apply for the uh, online access to Fence co Conference this summer. So you can go to our Facebook page and you will find all the information about this uh, fence opportunity. Uh, so, uh, another question. So, I think uh, we almost cover all the questions here, but the last one from uh, the cost of them, he is or she is basically asking about the cost of the giant trout. Is this something costly or is this something uh, possible to access easily everywhere? What's that? Uh, she, cost, of, cost of the giant rats, that may be an issue in the developing oh, countries. Oh, the giant rats is not that expensive. Uh, I think in Nigerian equivalent, uh, you can get a giant, one giant rat for about two dollars. Okay. About two dollars. So it's the greater cane rat that is um, quite expensive. So, so I think greater cane rats could cost um, close to a hundred dollars uh, or more. Hundred or fifty dollars. A question from Mahmoud Mayna, who is a co-organizer of this series. Okay. So uh, he said, great talk, Prof. Uh, he's asking you, about Mahmoud. the challenges of doing a neuroscience research in Nigeria or Africa in general. Uh, well, the challenges are there. Um, Maybe in a few sentences you can yeah. mention this. <laughs> yeah, challenges are there. But before I mentioning them is, is to say that challenges are there to be overcome um we shouldn't um develop the persistent attitude of only complaining about our challenges challenges are there to be overcome um but i agree there are great challenges um you have problems with electricity so you have to keep antibodies in the cold chain without interruption you have to do your immuno, you have to rock for homogenization of your mix. You can't afford power shortage or electricity interruption. So um, you have low, few access to grants. So, and I feel the way out of this, you there's either a, a, a vicious cycle of poverty 
or you have to develop a vicious cycle of excellence. So let me talk about the vicious cycle of excellence, which is what everybody has to aim for. You, you have a difficult environment. You have to initially sacrifice, um, spend money, sometimes your own money, try to get one or two antibodies, try to do a relatively good work, try to publish it in a good journal. It can actually even be a short communication. But once it's published, it's easier to talk with collaborators because many times collaborators, even when you want to work with them, they go find you out on PubMed to see what have you done so far. So if you can do a little, you publish, it's cited, collaborators see it, they now want to work with you, you write grants together. With grants together, you can now buy um, a, a power pack system that can make you maintain your cold chain. With that, you can do better work publish in higher rated journals, do another stronger collaboration, seek for a bigger grant, publish in bigger journals. So it, you can actually start off and little and enter into a vicious cycle of excellence. So there are challenges, but let's start to develop the attitude to overcome them. My challenge will be to the middle level um, seniors, senior lecturers, assistant professors, you have to, be conscious that you are working not just for yourself, but to bring up a better generation who will not go through the hassle that you went through. So if any, if you have that mentality, then you strive a little more to, to make things better for the next generation. And then we can start overcoming our challenges together. Okay, so okay. I think uh, we, can conclude, can, we can conclude with this last comment. And on behalf of the Secretary General of SUNA, uh, Professor Amadi Uhuno, I would like to thank you for uh, this wonderful talk and uh, thanks our audience for joining us and bye for now. Thank you.